Good morning. I'm Leonard Baines, Dean of the University of Houston Law Center. I'm delighted that UH Law Center and SMU, Denman School of Law, are co-convening this important conference entitled Black Lawyers Matter, Strategies to Enhance Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. After the tragic deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, and so many others, SMU's Dean Collins and I observed that there were still too few black lawyers. We strategized on a way and what we could do to make a difference. And we decided to co-convene this one day conference. We still have significant underrepresentation of African-Americans in the legal profession. Even 70 years after Heman Sweat was rejected by UT Law School solely based on his race. Instead of admitting, admitting Mr. Sweat, UT decided to build a whole university for African-Americans in order to thwart Mr. Sweat's admission to law school. Mr. Sweat had to bring a case all the way to the US Supreme Court in order to be admitted. Today, 70 years later, only 5% of lawyers in our nation are African-American. Less than 8% of first year law students in 2019 were black whereas 13% of the U.S. population is Black. A Columbia University study from about 10 years ago found that a majority of African-American law school applicants were rejected from every law school in which they applied. A majority were rejected from every law school to which they applied as compared to 34% of white applicants. The National Association of Law Placement found that the percentage of 2019 Black law graduates who found jobs requiring a law degree within 10 months of graduation was 62% as compared to 80% of white law school graduates. Law.com recently reported that the prestigious New York law firm Cravath, Swain and Moore has no African-American partners. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of work to be done. And our goal is that the audience will leave with best practices to increase the pipeline of black law students, lawyers, judges, and other legal professionals. Many thanks to UH and SMU staff and faculty and Dean's office, IT, alumni, communications, marketing to help put the conference together. together. Many thanks to Law School Admissions Council and Gail Withers for her sharing her technological expertise and assistance to this very important seminar and webinar. And many thanks to Bracewell LLP for their financial support for our keynote speaker, Professor David Wilkins. And many thanks to all our other sponsors. Some rules of the road for today. First, there should be breaks between each section or panel. And there will be a break slide indicating the upcoming session and what it will be. Second, but for those interested in CLE, there also be a slide with a QR code and other CLE information if you obtain. And that will be uh, broadcast now, uh, also at midday and at the end of the day. And we'll also have a slide three times a day highlighting our sponsors, which are delighted to help uh, promote the conference. I now turn it to my colleague and friend and co-convener, Collins, who's a Judge James Knoll Dean and Professor of Law at SMU Deadman School of Law for her opening remarks. Take it away, Dean Collins. Good morning. It is such a privilege to be with all of you today. I want to echo Dean Baines's remarks. It is truly an honor to be hosting this incredibly important conference in conjunction with the University of Houston. I want to extend my deepest thanks to the extraordinary teams at SMU and the University of Houston who have made this conference possible. I also want to thank the Law School Admissions Council and especially Gail Withers for hosting this conference and making all the technology work smoothly. And I hope you will bear with us on that front. I also wanna thank our incredible group of moderators, speakers, and sponsors. Without you and your commitment to this work, this conference would not have been possible. As a profession, we have been talking about these issues for decades, yet without any meaningful progress to show for it. Law remains one of the least diverse professions in the nation. That is unacceptable, it's inexcusable, and it's time to do something about it. It is our hope that this conference will leave you 
with some concrete ideas and strategies for how to create real, meaningful, and sustained change in your workplace, whether that is a law school, a law firm, a corporation, or a public interest organization. Black lawyers matter and Black law students matter, now and always. And SMU Law and the University of Houston Law Center are absolutely determined to do everything we can to demonstrate our commitment to that enduring principle. I hope all of you will join us in that commitment. Thank you so much for being here today, and we are looking forward to some terrific conversations. We do want to encourage you to carry on the conversation on social media if you would like. If you do, please use the hashtag Black Lawyers Matter 2020. One of the wonderful things about this initiative is the deans of all 10 Texas law schools were very enthusiastic supporters of this conference and all 10 will be participants in our program today. It is my great honor to welcome the first of those deans, Dean Michael Berry of South Texas College of Law to introduce our opening speaker. Good morning and thank you, Dean Collins. Approximately half of the law students at South Texas identify as minority, and therefore I spend a lot of time thinking about the community we create to support our minority students and the opportunities that our minority students will have in the legal profession. And I think about the phrase frequently, what we tolerate, we teach. When a professor tolerates lack of preparation in the classroom, that professor teaches other students that they too do not have to prepare for class. When a manager tolerates inappropriate behavior in an employee, the manager teaches other employees that that inappropriate behavior is acceptable. And when we as a society tolerate inequality, lack of representation, lack of opportunity, and disparate treatment of black attorneys in the legal profession, we teach the next generation of partners, judges, and general counsel that such discrimination is acceptable but the statistics that Dean Bain cites simply are not acceptable. We cannot tolerate it. If we are to address the lack of diversity that exists in legal representation, if we are to effectively correct issues relating to criminal justice, if we are to successfully tackle concerns related to access to justice for persons of color, it is imperative that we identify the systemic racial inequalities in the legal industry and proactively foster change at all levels. And that is why I am honored to join Dean Baines, Dean Collins, and the deans of all Texas law schools in committing to growing minority representation in the law. We can and we must do better. We must work together with a shared passion for equality and inclusion. And one substantial way we can do this is through addressing systemic racism through legislation which brings me to the distinct privilege of introducing US Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee of the 18th District of Texas, that is where I live in downtown Houston. I moved to Houston last year on July 19th, uh, the day before Houston, AKA Space City, celebrated the 50th anniversary of the 1969 lunar landing of Apollo 11. My wife and I walked over to the commemoration just in time to hear Congresswoman Lee addressing the space obsessed crowd. I will confess that as a new resident of Houston, I didn't know much about Congresswoman Lee, so I pulled out my iPhone and Googled her. To my dismay, I realized that our backgrounds made us completely incompatible. See, Congresswoman Lee earned her undergraduate degree at Yale and then went to the University of Virginia for law school where I had gone to UVA for law school and then Yale for my law degree. We had clearly nothing in common. How would we ever work together? But I quickly learned that in fact, we do have much in common. I've had the honor of working with Congresswoman Lee over the last year and have come to understand and appreciate the strength of her convictions, her commitment to her constituents, her dedication to justice and opportunity, and her steadfast and unwavering work on behalf of diversity, equity, and inclusion. As an example, Congresswoman Lee is ardent in her advocacy for criminal justice reform she is the first female ranking member of the U.S. House of Representatives Judiciary Subcommittee for Crime, Terrorism, Homeland Security, and Investigations. 
and her groundbreaking legislation in this area has solidified her status as a trailblazer in the reformation of our criminal justice system. In addition to her role on the House Judiciary Committee, she also is a senior member of the House Committees on Homeland Security and the Budget. Congressional Quarterly named her one of the 50 most effective members of all of Congress. U.S. News reports that she is one of the most 10 influential legislators in the House. And perhaps most relevant this week, 538.com gives her a 99% chance of retaining her seat on Tuesday or Wednesday or whenever votes are counted. She will not tolerate inequality. And she teaches us that we must be tireless in our advocacy for equality and justice. She is an ideal opening speaker for this Black Lawyers Matter Symposium. And it is my privilege to introduce the Honorable Sheila Jackson. Good morning. This is exciting. A virtual conference on Black Lawyers Matter. I'm Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, delighted to represent the 18th Congressional District. Thank you, Dean Barry, for that introduction. And thank you to all of the deans for their great leadership. Thank you to the conveners of this conference, Dean Baines and Dean Collins. Obviously, much thought went into this significant moment in history. Let me share some names with you. Barbara Jordan, a congresswoman, but previously a lawyer in her earlier life, practice on a corner in Fifth Ward, Texas. Of course, an African-American community, a brilliant mind, but was a solo practitioner. Certainly we applaud lawyers who help those who cannot help themselves. Solo practitioners, small firms, most of what African-American lawyers, black lawyers, and colored lawyers had to utilize throughout the decades, and one would say centuries. I know that you may be aware of the names of A. Martin Wycliffe, an early lawyer in the 1960s and 50s, or Matthew Plummer. Both were part of the generation of lawyers way preceding me and others who had to practice in a segregated Harris County justice system. Couldn't go to the cafeteria and could not go to the law library. My recollection serves me well. Matthew Plummer, his granddaughter now, a member of the Houston City Council, integrated and fought to ensure that the law library could certainly be open to all. How could you practice law? And then of course, Judge Gabrielle McDonald, the first ever black woman to be appointed to the federal bench under Jimmy Carter. I would venture to say that she was one of the few across the nation to ever be appointed to the federal bench. Carl Walker started off as a postman, even after he got his law degree then became a lawyer as the doors opened up and was appointed as the first ever U.S. attorney by, again, Jimmy Carter. And so even though this is a small smidgen of history, this does reflect on the journey of black lawyers. Thurgood Marshall, that everyone knows, became a justice on the United States Supreme Court, appointed by Lyndon Baines Johnson, started his work, maybe as a sole practitioner, uh, but moving toward something called the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, where he ran across the nation, protecting and fighting against the injustices of segregation. I say this, Charles Houston should be mentioned, is one of the scholarly lawyers of Thurgood Marshall's era, and he trained many giants. I guess if I keep going, I'll have to say Judge Leon Higginbotham has to be mentioned among many others. Many of these individuals I knew and admired, uh, and frankly, uh, they have histories that should have prominently placed them 
in some of the nation's top-notch law firms. But during their era, they either faced segregation and discrimination, and certainly absolutely no chance to be in important law firms around this country. And so this topic is crucial, but it takes more than a conference. It takes persistence and determination. Uh, it takes understanding. So as I stand here today to say black lawyers matter, then the very audience must understand and decipher black lives matter. For that provides the overall sensitivity to what black lawyers have gone through in many instances. Certainly there are black lawyers scattered throughout the nation who achieved the highest opportunities and became partners in law firms. Obviously, again, those individuals represent a minute few. 5% of the lawyers that we have in the nation are African-American lawyers. In the state of Texas, there are 6%, so we're slightly higher. And certainly as it relates to partners in law firms, there is a large lacking, a gaping hole uh, of that opportunity. Let me acknowledge Marty Wycliffe, who uh, became a partner at then Fulbright and Jaworski, now Norton Rose Fulbright. I too worked at that law firm along with the mayor of the city of Houston. We worked uh, and obviously uh, were able to take on other opportunities. I know that there are partners that came after Marty Wycliffe. I know of Rufus Comier and of course, Baker and Botts and others uh, who uh, reached that capacity in Houston, many in Washington, D.C., uh, many, of course, in New York and places elsewhere. So certainly there were members of our community who did become partners in law firms. But you see what is important is they became the ones and the twos. And it didn't last. They were a partner, uh, and it was two or three. When they moved on, or maybe retired, it might have been two or three or zero. Consistency has to be one of the issues that is discussed with all seriousness at this conference, and persistence, and a commitment to understanding the culture, the history, the rich history, uh, and the life of black lawyers black law students, and black people, African Americans in this nation. And so if you had a black lawyer at your law firm who happened to be particularly entrenched in the history of our people, maybe they would want to talk to you about reparations. And so there's an idea of trying to understand as much about those individuals that you would recruit and bring in. They might not have that discussion, but it would be nice if the culture of the law firm was so open that they would understand what reparations means. I happen to be carrying the legislation, H.R. 40, the commission to study and develop reparation proposals. That is a commission to ascertain uh, what was the cost, value, uh, and the impact uh, through the ages in the United States on African Americans, the descendants of enslaved Africans, but particularly uh, African Americans brought to this country in 1619, or in fact, African slaves brought to this country, what was the impact of bondage for over 200 years? These are things that are worth noting. Disparities in our community, which impact on why recruiting African Americans for law school and maintaining African Americans at your firm uh, might be a challenge if you don't understand our history. That bondage was severe, and we never, ever responded to. This legislation would provide an apology and begin to address through repair and restoration the existing disparities that find African-American children at the lowest levels of educational performance, not all, but a sizable population, or our health indicia of being uh, such that we have uh, 
ailments that others do not. COVID-19, highest number of deaths in both the African-American and Latinx community. Understanding why our neighborhoods suffer from environmental injustice and as well, the social justice system, the prison system, the criminal justice inadequacies, and of course, what we've been going through over the last years, the question of police misconduct and the loss of life. In this week, we have seen an individual shot and killed in Philadelphia. I'm sure you know the stories of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, certainly Jacob Blake, maybe Elijah, a young autistic man shot in Colorado, Tamir Rice, who was shot in a park at 12 years old because he had a mistaken, or a BB gun, mistaken for a gun, but never given the opportunity by police persons to come and to speak to him as a child to put it down. And then, of course, a young man trying to get home uh, to his little girl's birthday party, Mr. Brooks in Atlanta, and Ahmed Arbery, who wanted to be an electrician and was simply jogging. Things that we all get to do. And Eric Garner was the original I Can't Breathe. You know, I know most of their families. We have been engaged to try and do the right thing. At the same time, we all understand the importance of law and order, and we mourn the loss of our fallen heroes, as we have done, or I have done, time after time. You see, part of understanding recruiting black lawyers will be to understand that lawyers and African Americans um, who collectively are not anti-law enforcement or police. So when you recruit someone, you should have that understanding. What we are anti, of course, is a misconduct. And so, for example, suppose one of your young lawyers wanted to do something pro bono to help the community address the question of police misconduct or some other social injustice. Is your law firm prepared to assist them in that? I know that some law firms were pretty active in the anti-death penalty case, that's a good thing. I've met many young lawyers who were engaged in that, uh, who were African Americans and were at uh, the three year or four year or five year time uh, in the law firm. I don't know whether they stayed or not. But when you talk about recruiting, you have to recruit the community. You have to ensure that that lawyer is comfortable in their skin, in the work they've chosen, it's corporate work most likely, in large law firms, but as well, their sense of being and their sense of life. And so it can't be that let's recruit lawyers and come into an empty space. Just for your information, as I said, I was at Fulbright and Jaworski, uh, and I was also at Walhawk, Rader and Ross, which was a law firm in Washington, D.C. that I came to after graduating from the University of Virginia Law School, after graduating from Yale undergrad with honors in political science. And I went to Wall, Hawk Raider, and Ross, and I was the only African American at that time and the only African American that had ever been hired by that law firm. I think I did quite well, frankly, for that kind of culture shock. And they meant well, and I appreciate that. But certainly was a challenging situation if I didn't have my own personal sense of self-worth. You need to have a support system for lawyers, even in this time, that will come to your law firm. And I was able to speak to them, uh, and I took a leave to work on the Select Committee on Assassinations. Lawyers in Washington do that a lot, and that was in the United States Congress. But it gave me a sense of purpose and service, which really is really ingrained in a lot of those of us who went to law school who happened to be African Americans. By the way, in my class, there were only three African American women at the time I went to the University of Virginia Law School and a few numbers more of African American men. It was pretty stark. These are things that may not be addressed when a student comes to the school, uh, to the law firm. Those are things that should be considered. And then there should be an effort to recruit from historically black colleges and the law firms there. 
What comes to mind, of course, is Howard University and Texas Southern University. But in the midst of doing that, there's an infrastructure that those law schools can frankly uh, benefit from. And you need to start at that level. Getting into the mix of the law schools, that sounds like you are getting in the mix of someone else's business. But the law firms can do that. They can actually work uh, with the schools or maybe a plan on bar passage and how best to teach uh, students in those schools in the last year of their education, the third year. That would be a great benefit in many instances. These are bright youngsters. They have overcome a lot, even in the 21st century. Some of them may be first generation college students and certainly, amazingly, the first that has ever been to something as difficult as law school or graduate school. And so we have to think out of the box when you talk about black lawyers matter. You have to understand them. You have to understand culture. You have to understand uh, the issues that might, as, you, as they do the work in large law firms and build up the hours, what gives them a sense of passion and worth? Do you give them that opportunity as well? That really makes a difference. Do you let them talk about their history? Do you know who, as I said, Barbara Jordan was? Do you know who some of the older lawyers were? Judge Doyle, um, who practiced as one of the first judges to go to a higher court here in the state of Texas. That's what I think is a bird's eye view of having a sense of the importance of really getting to the bottom of recruiting, retention, and really happiness in the culture of your law firm as they are happy in the culture of their own history. That's what has to be part of building up more than just 5% lawyers and 6% in the state of Texas. It has to be a whole reformation. I've had the privilege of being engaged in most major legal arguments and legislative efforts. Uh, from the idea of protecting the Voting Rights Act and being part of its reauthorization, signed into law again by George Bush, overwhelmingly supported by the House and the Senate around 2007, going to the White House for a signing of that bill. Working with John Robert Lewis, the late iconic civil rights leader, on now trying to pass what is called the Voter Enhancement Act after the dastardly decision of the Shelby case, which imploded the Voting Rights Act that had been in place since 1965. How many law firms would understand how devastating that case was to those of us in the African-American and minority communities? How much it violated or caused the increase in voter uh, suppression all over the nation? Who would have offered a young black lawyer or a lawyer that was a partner? Why don't you get engaged in helping various states that are experiencing voter suppression. Why don't I lend you to the Legal Defense Fund of the NAACP or other organizations that are doing this kind of work? I understand that you're a business. I know it fully well. But just think of what that would mean to a young African-American lawyer for a period of time that would not diminish their ability to be a partner, thinking out of the box. Shelby case was a devastating Supreme Court decision came out of Alabama and took away Section 5, which Section 5 was really the armor of that particular legislation, which said that any change in voting laws needed to be vetted in those states that were voting rights states. And that included the South and included Texas, included by Lyndon Baines Johnson, who did so because of discrimination against Hispanics in the state of Texas. These are unique thoughts about solidifying the relationship between that new lawyer that you've just recruited and their life story. Now, every African-American is not the same. 
and you might find someone who has their own track uh, and it is similar to any other lawyer. That's all well and good. People are individuals. But if you want to see an increase that is sizably recognized of African Americans in law firms across America or across this state, then I can assure you there has to be a reckoning of this cultural uniqueness uh, and an appreciation for their history, even though they're young, even though they're young, the history that they've come from, and to recognize it and to appreciate it. You have partner meetings or law firm meetings. Make a special effort to have individuals who have something to say from the African-American community. Certainly you can call on judges, the few that there might be in the federal uh, courts, or others uh, like an Eric Holder, maybe, former attorney general, or some others that you might wish to have a conversation with. Sometimes those of us who have been here and have our own history and accomplishments are treated like an old shoe and don't get invited to be at graduations or to be at uh, meetings at the law schools or even at law firms. You might think about that. People right in your midst who have a world of history, who themselves have graduated from prominent law schools and undergrads, or either have shown themselves well through their career and happen to be African-American men and women, or maybe even a member of the United States Congress. So I am delighted to have had the opportunity to be able to congratulate you on this very important step forward. But I tell you, there have been many step forwards like this, starts and stops. And I think what America needs now, I would think, is really to pass H.R. 40 in the House and the Senate. It's got amazing support by mayors and senators and business persons uh, and leadership. Uh, and it can make a big difference when we take a deep dive on the ongoing disparities in the African-American community. It'd be nice uh, if this legislation was advocated for by some of you, even law firms, because it is an important step forward, just in general, in dealing with African-Americans. At the same time, it'd be important to also reflect on these cases that tragically are coming up so that everyone gets due process in these cases that are police misconduct. Ones that deal with the uh, offended person, the person who's lost their life and their family, and the due process that is, of course, owed to law enforcement. The legislation, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, I encourage you to read it. Uh, it is a fair uh, and even-handed initiative to help police by providing sizable money of funding for reimagining police in terms of accreditation, 18,000 police departments in America. Some are a one person police department. We provide resources for training, accreditation, uh, and the understanding of de escalation or the understanding of not using excessive force at the same time protecting themselves and the understanding of the duty to intervene if someone is misbehaving uh, inappropriately with the guidelines and laws. The ending of racial profiling is in that bill. The independent investigations, the pattern and practice, consent decrees that many police departments have appreciated to give them a roadmap to do what they want to do is to be good guardians and public safety uh, proponents in these communities. We can see some of that right here in Houston, Texas. with The leadership of the mayor uh, and our chief of police uh, there have been some very interesting strides being made by our own police department. We can see it in their interaction with the community. The sheriff's department, likewise, with leadership at the top, we've seen uh, attitudes where they want to work with the community. And, of course, we certainly want them to be safe, and we want community members to go home as well. There's needless to say that there is violence that has been surging here and around the nation. We don't condone that. We want peaceful protests, nonviolent protests, and we don't want young people killing themselves, killing each other with gun violence. That's something that could be a roundtable discussion in law firms that may be of interest to your young African-American lawyers as well. So finding topics beyond the practice that you're engaged in 
to have a fully welcoming space to be in, I believe, plays into the true commitment of not having a start and stop. So with this conference, 10 years from now, your work should show a result. Your work should show 10 partners in law firms throughout this community. And when I say that, 10 in each firm throughout this community. Why? Because you recruited with persistency, determination, and continuity. And you had a reflection on the culture of those that you were recruiting. It would go for others as well, whether they're Southeast Asian, whether they're Native American, whether they're Latinx, whether they are of different uh, European backgrounds. Uh, all of that in this new world, I believe, is important. And then look how much you can get done by tackling environmental concerns, social justice concerns, uh, and uh, helping to heal uh, this community and frankly heal the nation. Lawyers are powerful. They take a wonderful oath. They uphold the law. And more importantly, they bring to life the Constitution who had opened up and said, we have formed this government, to paraphrase it, to create a more perfect union. And then to have uh, the reality of the Bill of Rights, a unique set of amendments that focus on the ending of slavery, due process, equality, freedom of speech, freedom of access, the right to privacy, the right to uh, a trial by a jury of your peers, and the right to freedom of religion. Elements of what democracy is all about. Lawyers are the defenders of democracy. They uphold the Constitution. We love that as African Americans because it is the very reason of our existence and our protection. You know, needless to say, that as the Constitution was written, we were not a hold person. But yet we cherish this Constitution and that is the law. And so we love the law. We are perfect for being part of law school and perfect for being part of your firms. You have to make the commitment that we are good for your firms. I think we are, but it is worth your reinforcement of that throughout your law firm, with your staff, with your partners, your management team, and great things can happen. And so as this conference goes forward, I am very delighted to wish you well, because I believe we have the framework for something unique. And if you have need, I'm always prepared to do a lecture here or there in your law firms or at your law schools because knowledge is power. I love history and I love the years of service that I've been able to give in the House Judiciary Committee, serving as ranking member and chairperson of many of the subcommittees from intellectual property or member, immigration, storied history that I have on immigration issues to constitutional issues, criminal justice issues, and of course, something that I truly enjoyed between antitrust and intellectual property. So it's not an advertisement, it is just a reflection of so many others that you could call to provide uh, an opportunity uh, for your young lawyers or young law students to get to see the world through our eyes and through our life story. Thank you again for giving me this grand and great opportunity to be able to speak to good news and an important change that may come. Those of you who are virtually on uh, this conference that are students, you have even a greater opportunity to recognize the value of multiculturalism and rich diversity. I always want to emphasize that those two elements are not denying someone an opportunity or denying someone a right. It is only just giving a little bit more room for someone else to stand alongside of you or walk through the door. That's what America is for me. And that is what I believe lawyers who, again, hold up the Constitution should be in the forefront of. We are those who believe in justice and we believe in what is right. As I close, let me just make one point about uh, the opportunity I had to serve on the Texas State Bar Board, Texas Young Lawyers, Houston Lawyers Association, Houston Bar Association, and Black Women Lawyers. These are opportunities that should be emphasized for all young lawyers, 
but particularly African-American lawyers. I remember when I served on the Texas State Bar Board, I was one of the few and first uh, black lawyers to serve on that board. That kind of experience and exposure is good for lawyers to have a sense of community uh, and connection, particularly if you recruit black lawyers, African-American lawyers from across the nation. So I thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts and to emphasize how important this conference is and how important your ultimate conclusions will be. But it is all in the continuity uh, and the completion of the job. And yes, persistence and determination. It is a high calling to be a lawyer. Uh, the defenders of the Constitution and the laws of this land. I know that I truly enjoyed it in all of the capacities that I've had the privilege of serving. This can be a great opportunity for expanding the horizons of young black lawyers, young black law students. I wish you well uh, in this journey, and I hope that we will have an opportunity to see your final report, but also your final results. And in 10 years from now, a decade, we'll see a massive reformational change in lawyering, uh, in lawyering across America, in law firms across America. Good luck and God bless America. Thank you for your insight, Congresswoman Lee, and for your tireless work for equality and for justice, as well as thank you for joining us this morning at this important conference. The reason for this diversity symposium is simple. The reason we need individuals like Congresswoman Lee to challenge our thinking is simple. We have grown accustomed to tolerating circumstances that are simply unacceptable. What we tolerate, we teach. If we do not start changing the rhetoric now, if we do not make an intentional effort to follow through on that commitment, as Congresswoman Lee mentioned, then the next generation will come to assume that a lack of black representation in the legal profession is acceptable. It is not. We cannot tolerate it. And if African-American representation in the legal profession is to increase, it starts with African-American representation in law school.